Over the mountains and the seas, your river runs with love for me, and I... Oh, hi everybody. How you doing today? Well, I'm going to continue in the devotional in the Gospel of Mark, and um, we're going to start reading about the beginning of Jesus' uh, teaching and his miraculous ministry. We saw his ministry of proclamation as being the very first thing that he does. He's proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near to us. It's not near in time. It's near in, in literal space with us. It's not something we have to wait for and that we're encouraged basically to enter into this kingdom and to receive this kingdom now. And so it really is sort of like, you know, going into uh, something that <laughs> you think you're not prepared for. A kindergartner suddenly being told, okay, you can go to college right now. That's not a good analogy at all. What it's saying is, is that this is what you were created for all along and you're in the wrong place and you don't think that the right place is acceptable or accessible. And so you need to, but, th but Jesus is saying you can get there. I can show you how to do it. And there's two things that he's requiring. He's saying, first of all, you have to repent. You have to change your mind. Literally, that's what the word means, metanoia in the Greek. And that means definitely change your mind about what is good, what's right for you, what habits you should be about. The church has gone to town on that. They're not wrong to do that. But they've missed the other part, which repentance is not just, you know, repenting from your sins, the things that you feel guilty for, or the things that you realize God says you should never have been doing or thinking or have been about before. But it really is also a turning towards something where we're running in. And then we have to believe this good news. What's the good news again? It's that the kingdom of God is near to you. The kingdom of heaven is near to you. It's not far away. You don't have to wait for it, like I keep saying. So... When we start believing that, then all of a sudden we're involved in a different type of lifestyle. And there, there couldn't be a further uh, disparity than between what religion often is encountering with God and what walking with Jesus is like. And so, uh, now again, Jesus is not anti-religious. He goes to temple, he goes to synagogue, he participates in prayer times, he's very traditional in all those certain ways, so he's not against. He's just that and so much more. <laughs> and so much more. And we're going to read what the so much more is in just a moment. But the idea is we have to believe that the kingdom of heaven is near to us, and that changes our perception of what is possible, in fact, what we can expect in any given day. If we encounter a sickness and it's anywhere near the kingdom of heaven, can we pray and can that sickness be destroyed? If someone has a need around us and the, we realize we actually believe and we trust in this great revelation that the kingdom of God is near to us, can we pray and ask God to bring provision and to eliminate that need in that person's life? All kinds of different things change in your mind. You get a new mindset. That's repentance, metanoia. And, and all of a sudden you start to behave very much differently. Now, one of the things that changes is who we think uh, you know, has access to the kingdom of God. And so we think, well, the good people, the holy people, the nice people, the kind people, they certainly can come into the kingdom. Jesus demonstrated a radically different truth, and that is that the rough people, the, the tough people, the, the people who are maybe stubborn, or maybe even we consider them slow, that the kingdom of God is accessible to them. Now, does that mean if you're having above average intellect that you can't come into the kingdom? Of course not. You can come. Come with all of your smarts, with all your brains. But on the other hand, God demonstrates something through Jesus that's so important, and that is that the rough and the shoddy are welcome. In fact, Jesus seemed to particularly aim his life and his ministry towards those people. So verse 16, Mark chapter 1, verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. I don't know what image of fishermen you have in your head, but fishermen were tough guys back then. They're still tough guys today. I mean, if you watch those shows where they're fishing for the crabs, you know, off of Alaska or where, wherever they might be doing, there's a bleep after almost every word those guys say. And yet Jesus is targeting these particular people and saying, come and follow me. Now, they certainly heard more probably from Jesus than just this call, come and follow me. They probably heard his message that the kingdom of God is near to them, that they don't have to wait, that they can repent and they can believe in this right now and enter into a completely new life. And so I think what's happening here is they're responding to the proclamation message of Jesus and they're just jumping into it. 
That's a surprising thing because we often judge who's going to respond to God and who won't. And that will actually stop us from stepping out into new areas, into new frontiers. And what we need to understand is we're not competent to judge people's hearts and their minds. But God actually will <laughs> lead us into all kinds of extraordinary encounters when we realize sometimes the person we felt is the furthest from is actually the most ready to receive. And the person we might think, oh, they're so nice, they're so kind, it's going to be so easy for them to come into the kingdom. Man, they actually have a lot of resistance. We just never, ever know. So, you know, the old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. Wow, we really need to put that into practice. And I had an experience of that when I first started saying, I'm going to start talking about the, the gospel in the way that Jesus, where he started. And I was at a gas station, and there was a man, he was tough looking, he had tattoos, he just kind of looked like he was into himself. And I turned towards him and I began a conversation thinking, God, this is not going to work. This guy's not going to respond to me. And I don't know if he's going to be interested in all in what I had to say. And we had a marvelous conversation. He allowed me to pray for him. He opened up his heart to God. And it was just amazing. And so again, let God do the choosing. Leave the choosing out of your repertoire. Just don't do it. Just, just experiment. Just go out and explore what God is doing. I think that's the proper thing for us to do. So Jesus looks at these two fishermen and he says, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. So the interesting thing again is these guys, it looked like they were set. They've got their career. They've got their path in life. Uh, they can't leave their business, right? But actually, they were in the place in their hearts and their minds when they heard Jesus' message and his call to follow him. They were immediately ready. And isn't that, again, so many of our stories or stories that we've heard of someone who we d wouldn't expect to be interested in Jesus. And yet, all of a sudden, they have this moment where immediately they just change everything. Ah, that's so wonderful. See, the closeness of God's kingdom should raise our expectations that we never know exactly what he's going to do, but we're looking for the good things that he will do. And once they left their nets and followed him, when he'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left, with their, they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. So they are beginning this journey with Jesus. In fact, what we're finding out from these next several passages is that Jesus is not just proclaiming that God and his kingdom are near. He's demonstrating it. Now, here's a provocative thought. If Jesus did that with his very, very first followers, is he still interested in doing it with his present day followers? I mean, if you responded to Jesus and say, OK, I'll, uh, I'll follow you. Teach me, master, rabbi, uh, what is the truth? And I'm going to respond to it with repentance in my heart and my mind and my actions. And then I'm also going to learn how to trust you. And that trust always means risk. Faith means risk. So they take a risk. They leave what's familiar, which is always, I think, a good thing to do. One little thought on that. The exciting things in your life are on the frontiers of your life, in those areas you haven't explored. And that's true. When God calls us into an unfamiliar area, something we haven't done before, someone we haven't talked to before, uh, you know, a type of experience maybe we thought, mm, that's not for me. And yet Jesus is calling you. Maybe he's doing it through the Bible, through the word of God. Maybe he's doing it through some other type of revelation, um, you know, uh, an, an urging, an, an, an imprint on your mind, a dream that you had. And all of a sudden you're open to something you weren't before explore that. I think you're going to find that your life gets more exciting, gets more deep, and you experience <laughs> the demonstration that God is with you, which, you know, there's nothing more important than to understand that God is with you, that he loves you, that he's for you, and we fight against that. So they're following him. Now, interesting thing is, is that this theme of God choosing unexpected people is all throughout the New Testament, but I think it's most clearly stated, uh, you know, by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when he basically says, God's got a plan and something going on here that is really amazing, unexpected, and really good. He's choosing people that we didn't expect, not always the religious people, although he does choose them, 
not always the nice and the clean people, although he will choose them. But he's choosing some kind of interesting people. And yet he's doing it, um, you know, really to show his love and his glory and his power. And so this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. This is not a good thing to say to a group of people, right? <laughs> not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us the wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So again, this concept of um, God choosing the unexpected, absolutely essential in the demonstration that the kingdom of God is near. And I think almost everyone recognizes this when they hear the story of someone they considered, you know, uh, not the sharpest <laughs> tool in the box. Someone who, again, you know, w was, was involved in shameful things. Maybe it was drugs. Maybe it was gangs. Maybe it was something else. And yet God has taken them and he's purified them. And he's made them righteous and holy through Jesus, through knowing him and the power of his cross and his resurrection. And suddenly we see and hear in their testimony and most importantly in their life and their lifestyle, you know, an evidence of the great glory of God. Now, why is this important? Not just because God could save one of the worst of us human beings, but, but here's the real point, is that God is unrestricted in our lives. We don't know how far he's going to take us, even in this very day, in one day. <laughs> These four fishermen upended everything in their lives and traded what was normal for them for what was adventurous, for what was just common to all of a sudden extraordinary. And what if that's true for you and I today? So part of this understanding of the kingdom of God being near to us, we need to change our minds about absolutely everything. We need to put our trust in Jesus is to realize that we need to be willing that if God called, if Jesus said, that he can upend everything and take something, maybe even something that we consider the poorest thing in our lives. Maybe you're absolutely terrified of public speaking. Oh, this is a terrible thought, but I'm going to give it to you. Maybe you're terrified of public speaking, and yet God is going to use you, even this day, to speak to a group of people, and his kingdom is going to be demonstrated and break out in that place. Well, more on this in the future. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Have a fantastic day.